everyone and welcome to the school of ancient wisdom we have our spiral of wisdom that's the satsang and we were supposed to have mr rk dham today but he called swati i think at one o'clock in the afternoon and said he's traveling he won't be able to come for this so we're not in the habit of cancelling our thursday satsangs and we said, even if there are two or three, we will have it. So we called Ramesh and he thankfully said, yes, he would talk. So Guru Purnima is on the third of next month. And Ramesh, has, you know, he decided that he would talk oh, on Guru Purnima. So now I ask Deepti to begin with the school prayer. Oh, he didn't like life vibrant in every atom oh hidden light shining in every creature oh hidden love embracing all in oneness may each who feels himself as one with thee feel one with every other thank you Dipti. and now i would like you to introduce ramesh okay so i don't think ramesh ranati needs any formal introduction um, uh, he's uh, somebody who has a keen interest in spirituality and has been associated with the school for many years. And uh, he has studied uh, automotive styling in the UK. And uh, so many of us know him personally as well. So he is here to talk to us on uh, Guru Purnima. Over to you, Ramesh. Thank you. Welcome Thank you. once again. Ramesh will be talking to us on the relevance of Guru Purnima. Over to you, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you, Sajani, and thank you, Deepti. Um, it doesn't feel like I'm a speaker today. It feels more like, um, you know, we're all just um, sharing our, our experiences and thoughts amongst our School of Ancient Wisdom family. I've been a part of this family, and I consider this my family because we are a karmic soul group. And... Um, with uh, Ma, Ma Manize being our, our guru when it comes to the School of Ancient Wisdom. So with her blessings, we can take this forward. So um, now uh, I'd like to share the screen. So I'm, uh, let me see now. Yes. So please let me know if um, my screen is visible to you all. Yes, it's visible. We can see the slides. Right. So, um, why did I choose now when Sajani suddenly called me today? I was in the middle of something else, a lot of running around to do. And I initially declined, but then I understood that this is a commitment that we all have for each other, for our, our, our family, our group as a whole. And um, the next thing that came to my mind was, Guru Purnima happens in just a few days' time. Today is the 29th. So on Monday is when many around the world celebrate Guru Purnima. But there is a modern relevance to it. Um, where shall I begin now? You see, my Guru would ask us to, you know, before we start, to invoke the Guru principle. So I shall do that. <clears throat> with these words. Akhanda mandala karam vyaptam yena chara charam tatpadam darshitam yena tasmai sri gurave namaha agnyanati mirandasya jnana anjana shalakaya Chakshurun militam yena tasmai sri gurave namaha Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwara Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tasmai Sri Gurave Nama. The Guru Stuti. 
So we have now invited the Guru principal to conduct the session through our presence here. And um, the meaning of this is very poignant. It says, I salute the preceptor who enabled me to have the vision of the Lord, who pervades all the moving and non-moving entities and surrounds all of the universe. For those who believe in one God, or for those who believe in multiple gods, or for those who don't believe in God, but who believe, I'm sure, for all those who have come here, they believe in that universal source, universe. This is, the, is what they're talking about here in the first line. In the second line, I salute the preceptor who opened my eyes, which were blinded by the dark veil of ignorance with the dart of wisdom. Please keep this in mind because we shall re revisit that further, or further on. And the third line says, I salute the preceptor who himself, the divine trinity, and who is verily the supreme Godhead. So basically this is the connection to the source of everything that we have. Now Guru Purnima is a day that is celebrated in many amongst many denominations. I have a few examples here in my quick research. Um, Guru Purnima represents a day on which Lord Shiva, as the Adi, Adi Guru, or the original Guru, taught the seven Rishis, the Sapta Rishis that we've heard Mahamanisi talk about so many times, who are the seers of the Vedas. Guru Purnima also marks the birthday of Veda Vyasa Muni, in the Yoga Sutras, Ishvara as Pranava or the Om is said to be the Adi Guru of Yoga. And Lord Buddha himself was said to have delivered his first sermon on this day at Sarnath, reflecting the power of this sacred time. Now, why is this sacred? There are some very interesting analogies that I um, have come across. And also, I will connect it to why it is relevant to modern day India or Bharat as this place was traditionally known as. I'm going to speak from the perspective of Sanatana Dharma because I'm more familiar with it. But the beauty of the Sanatana Dharma is that we talk about Vasudeva Kutumbaka, which means the world is one family. Now, what is why is that important? It is because this Dharma or way of life is a universal way of life and it includes everybody. Not only all the human beings, but all the living, all the beings on earth. Be they animals, flora, fauna, be they unseen beings. I'm talking about there definitely are entities which especially people who are more spiritually aware of will be will know, which are beyond the perception of the five senses. You can call them divine entities, you can call them other entities, but all the entities are included when we say Sarve Bhavantu Sukinaha. Sorry, my Sanskrit pronunciation is a bit anglicized, but I will I keep trying to make sure that I pronounce it well. So my, please um, forgive me on that count if I get it wrong. Because I'm a seeker, I'm trying my best to my the best of my abilities. So, um, if you look at what the what guru is in English, because we're we're speaking in English at the moment, guru is one who's enlightened and who's a self-realized master. He's an intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually evolved person who leads a virtuous life, having attained a higher level of consciousness. So. In all religions, they honor their particular founder, prophet, or savior. That's, that is what we've observed. But Sanatana Dharma doesn't really have a founder per se. If you look at the annals of uh, where it came from, nobody really knows where it came from, but the Vedas have been written and various masters over the ages have been a channel of that universal knowledge. So. Sanatana Dharma honors the guru or spiritual master as a principle in itself. It's not just about an individual person. That's where it's kind of 
is rather unique, you know, stands out from the normal idea of a particular founder, prophet, or savior. So it is beyond any particular personality, philosophy, or revelation. The guru is a cosmic principle. It takes many names and forms. And we can follow the guru that best takes one back to our true higher self. So therefore, it is very liberating. You know, a guru can be can come in many different forms. And um, the best part is the guru is actually a conduit of our connection with the universe. So as such, there's only one true guru in all the gurus that uh, represent that one true guru. There is only one true guru in that sense. Now, what is the importance of having a guru? There is a relevance. And you know, it's rather interesting as I share the in the slides to come, how it is also connected with Bharat or, you know, we, we call it India at the moment, but the original spiritual name of this land before all the you know, colonial uh, thing, uh, brainwashing and uh, all the invasions was Bharata Vamsha, which means the land of Bharat. And it wasn't just one, one kingdom, it was a multiple, it was a set of kingdoms which all followed the basic Sanatana Dharma, the basic way of life. So whether they traded with each other or whether they fought with each other, they still followed these principles. And that's what makes it so enduring and it is bounced back every time after every invasion it is still bounced back because it speaks the language of love and truth that's what ultimately we're connecting with here now I, I put this slide to give it a modern relevance you see if you look at <clears throat> people who are very strongly uh, operating on the material front you will be looking at material prosperity aishwaryam which is also spoken about in our Vedas as a natural part of Grihastha people. And most people, Grihastha people are those who are in the family way of life. And most of us here belong to a, a family, you know, father, mother, children, grandchildren, and so on. Um, and some, some may even belong to an extended family. Now, though, so we are all Grihasthas. Now, we, we don't have to be a yogi to follow the path of self awareness of spiritual awareness. We don't have to be a yogi. In fact, it might be even tougher to be a family member, a family person, and follow these aspects of personal growth because many times our personality buttons are pushed when we're living in society. So it is quite um, relatively easier when one has established uh, oneself in, a, in, a, in solitude and when one does the japa or chanting or meditation. It is relatively easier, apart from the material aspects which generally get taken care of by the universe. It is relatively easier compared to living in a grihastha ashram where you are, the, the veil, you know, is firmly in place and you have to put in the effort every day to remove that veil and see the truth, the veil of maya. So if you look at this, the material aspects, Jeff Be Bezos is um, extremely popular and very rich, the world's richest man in 2020, Amazon founder and CEO. And in and many of them, many of these very rich, materially very rich people, I must tell you, have a very strong gut feeling. It's called business acumen. They know who to do business with. And I'm sure if you know wealthy families, you will see that they will actually operate on this business sense. They know who to do business with. They know where to invest their money, at what time to invest, and what time to take it out, and so on. And many times, without them revealing their secrets, they would also be futurologists. That's one of the reasons why um, a Mother Earth or Prakriti Devi would have blessed them, apart from their karma, with so much of abundance. So many of these people can actually pro project quite accurately. That's how they get to be so, and so successful in business as well. Might seem strange for me to say such things, but I wanted to connect spirituality with our day-to-day -day life. And what better way than this? So if you look at what Jeff Bezos says, it says the 21st century is going to be an Indian century. Bob Cernfels, he, he also says that it, it is not India's decade, it is India's century. So what does it mean? It means that we are actually in the right place physically, you know, the right country 
which is going to sh take the world forward. There are a lot of indications, and economically also, as per proje uh, projections, India is going to really rise in the next 10 to 15 years, which are going to be, by the way, as per spiritual predictions, very tumultuous years for the world at large, where thanks to uh, human beings, ignorance, and the industrial revolution-based education, uh, human beings have lived in a very unsustainable manner and Mother Earth will be giving us back a return gift by the way of many of these natural calamities coming in and also by the way of some wars. Thankfully, it may not be a world war, but smaller wars around the globe. The geopolitical stage will change and Sanatana Dharma, which is a universal way of living, which is a sustainable way of living, will then start finding purchase. And indications of that, by the way, of India's growing soft power are already seen if you look at World Yoga Day, if you look at the popularity of Indian movies, Indian songs, Indian food. If you look at YouTube, you will see the highest number of um, India-related videos because they get the highest uh, clicks and subscribes simply because the country is so large. So it is not by chance that all these things are happening. Now, that sets the stage to the relevance of us being over here in Bharat and its growing relevance in the world and its growing soft power. At the moment, the, the, world, the country with the number one soft power is the US. And the, uh, the last century has always been a place, a time when all of us have yearned for that kind of, almost all of us would have yearned for that kind of a, an American lifestyle, you know, uh, the the so high levels of civic sense, the technological prowess, the um, sheer good quality of life that the West affords and so on and so forth. But you would be surprised to know, as per even Western research, the historical trend beyond about 300 years back shows something that's quite interesting, you know. This, this is the source of the statistics of world population GDP, gross domestic product, and per capita gross domestic product. Now, from 180, when, when Christ was, you know, when he came down, um, to, or maybe was it when he left, uh, to the current, uh, towards the current years, you will find that if you look at the gross domestic product, that is the total economic produce and the prosperity of a country, you would find actually that India was at the number one position, uh, far stronger than what USA is now. And then gradually it came down. And after the Industrial Revolution, it plummeted down thanks to colonialism, etc., which is part of our country's karma. But now it is going back up again. So that lays the foundation, uh, the material foundation for the spiritual growth of the significance of Sanatana Dharma and its principles, and therefore Guru Purnima. Now, why are we talking about this nature cycles? You see, when if we are to live in a sustainable, a sustainable lifestyle, it is inevitable that we have to come to a realization that we are all interconnected. And that is what Sanatana Dharma teaches us. The industrial revolution-based philosophies was more about, as you would have seen, um, um, especially in the West, people are very personal-centric. You know, they're very person-centric, individual-centric. It's about, about how I perceive life and, uh, you know, am I getting the, the best out of life? But Eastern philosophies on, um, excuse me, on the whole at large, as also other native philosophies like, say, the Red Indians, in the America, North Americas, the Incas in South Americas, the African tribals, the Aborigines in Australia, and so on. And the, uh, the, the earlier Japanese and Chinese civilizations, they are were very similar to Sanatana Dharma. In what sense? In the sense that they were in harmony with nature. Even if you look at the pagan uh, belief systems in Europe, they were in harmony with nature. And they saw many things that were, they were aware of subtle energies which were not perceived by the five senses. Now, and they were more heart-based. You see, when you're heart-based and not purely mind-based, you also feel. And you, when you can feel the connection of one human being with the other, that we are all a part of a singularity, a part of a whole, the Atma, that, that we are an Atma, we're not this body, and we are a part and parcel of that Paramatma, the Super Soul. 
the attitude towards life will change. So in Sanatan Dharma, the beauty behind all these festivals and various aspects of our native cultures will derive a very strong relevance. Why is that? Because every time we connect with nature, we become more humane. You must have noticed that. Even the children, the more we connect them with nature, the more, we, more humane they become. And if you look at Waldorf education, where Rudolf Steiner, the German who came over to live in Bharat in the early 20th century with Madame Blavatsky and others, Theosophical Society, he went back and he propounded certain aspects called nature cycles. You know, that if the more exposed we are to nature cycles, the more humane we become. And that's how we can support our children to live a more sustainable life and teach them this. So in some ways, the, the parents can be the first guru of the child. Now, I'll give an example of a nature cycle. For example, if you eat a fruit and you take the seed and you plant it in a, in a, in a pot at home, and suppose you train the child to do that, and then you get them to also uh, form a rhythm every day where they water that plant, water that seed, and then they watch it blossom into a plant and bear fruit. And then you take that fruit, which is a product of your own efforts and, of course, nature's magic, and you consume the fruit and you take the peels and you compost them and put them back into the pot. That is one nature cycle. So that's one cycle of life. You've exposed the child then to a very important lesson, multiple lessons actually, on how to rear, how to support the growth of another life. That requires a lot inside subtly, you know, a lot for the child to shift from just treating that plant like an object, which can, which where you can just yank and pluck the flowers off, to treating it with love and respect, and watching it grow and blossom. So, just imagine one small instance that I've given you makes you, I mean, makes you so much better a person, you know. And if you teach your children this, it can be a wonderful aspect of making them more humane in our city environment. We don't need to go out to nature. It can just happen in your balcony, for example. Now, there are other nature cycles I've discovered, and these are our Indian festivals. It is not just about having a party or, you know, an occasion for people to meet. No, it is an occasion for people to meet with Mother Nature. And if you look at various festivals, you have the spring festivals, you have the winter festivals, you have the summer festivals and so on. They all signify a celestial, uh, a connection with the celestial bodies, the universe, and bringing it, bringing it to the relevance of Guru Purnima. This nature cycle puts us in touch with the brightest moon. Now, why is it significant? Now, the moon stands out. How is it the brightest, by the way? You see, as you can see the date here, the summer solstice happens on the 21st of June, the World Yoga Day. It was not chosen just randomly. It was chosen with a great deal of thought by the yogis. And that's how um, to herald the growing soft power of Bharat or India, um, uh, Modi ji had propounded the idea of choosing a universal date like the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere because most of the countries are most of the population of the world lives in the northern hemisphere so uh, one date had to be chosen that was chosen as the world yoga day because in yoga we connect we have to if we have to maintain the bodies on earth it is the sun who we pray, uh, pay our obeisances to. Because it, as we all know in science, the sun is a source of all material sustenance and life cycles on Earth. So now just after the summer solstice, this is the very first full moon is Guru Purnima day. And that is the brightest moon. Why is that? Because the duration of sunlight and the intensity of sunlight in the Northern Hemisphere is the maximum on this particular day. So you have the brightest moon on this day. And that is how uh, celestially Guru Purnima is connected to this time. So there's a lot of other um, subtle significance to that aspect. And I'll be coming to that shortly. Likewise, we also have the darkest moon uh, on 21st of December. Uh, and that is a, a different festival, as you might know. 
Now, let's get to the crux. What does Guru mean? You know? <clears throat> Without getting into the Sanskrit words, I would say, as we are, many of us would already know, the, there's a very strong relevance to the sound Gu that represents darkness. And the sound Ru represents its secession or removal. So, a guru is a person who, or is a book or uh, an experience that dispels darkness. It basically just removes, it does not give you something per se. You know, a guru is not somebody who gives you, you know, some special, he can of course give you, I mean, he can pray for divine mercy, he can reduce your karmas and they all take it away altogether, depending on how much you've grown in your life. But actually the main, what the Guru mainly does is it removes our, he or the book or the situation removes our ignorance. And that should tell you something. Because if our ignorance is removed, what does it mean? It means that actually at a soul level, we have access to all that awareness. That awareness that allows us to self-realize that we are a soul and body, you know, we're not this body. And it's not about sense gratification, but life is about self-realization ultimately. So that's what the Guru principle does. It just removes your ignorance. And I remember my Guru. I have a wonderful Guru, Sri N, though I don't get to meet him often. And I I many times I um, I've turned to other gurus or other books or situations but I follow, I, I do my best to follow his instructions and it definitely is helping and I will share about it in, um, in due course if we have time so um, I, what he would say is, look if you come to uh, me and ask me where NG Road is I would point you in that direction and say please go, go in that direction and you will find NG Road now if you are so happy with my instructions that you start clinging onto my feet, you will not be growing. You need to put in the effort yourself. If NG Road is the ultimate self-realization, then you need to put in the effort. You can't just cling onto your Guru's feet and pray that the Guru takes you there without putting in much effort. So basically, you have to put in the effort. And that's really how... Oh, well, Wonderful. So, of course, uh, we in Bharat say that it is um, given by the Dev. And it is a that the the three syllables, the akara, the ukara, and the makara. So as you chant, uh, you experience vibration in the lower chakras, o, the vibration in the middle, middle mid region, and n, you experience the vibrations in the, the higher chakras. So uh, the upper chakras. Now, that raises our consciousness. So after ramkara, we feel more quiet. And there is also a silent uh, syllabus, syllable that is the silence that comes between each omkara, that is the language of the soul. And many times you'll find when we are withdrawn, when we are very unhappy, for example, or sad, or if we're just still, it doesn't have to be only happiness, by the way. Because happiness is not something that teaches us things, you know. If we enjoy it, it's an outcome of our good karma or good deeds. But um, sadness is not something that we have to necessarily uh, run away from. But if we accept and if you are present, you will find that it can teach you a lot of things. Or it can take you to a space of silence more effectively. Or even loneliness for that matter. Let We can change the interpretation that loneliness is bad. Loneliness may not be. In fact, many wise people might appear to be lonely, might feel lonely in some way, but that will assist them in being connected to the universe. And I've experienced it. Sometimes once you open yourself up and become fully self-aware, you'll find that you're, you're connected with so many things around you. The nature speaks to you in wonderful ways. You might have a question and dynamically it will give you an answer. You know, 
Like for example, you might be sitting in a bus and you might be asking a question. And suddenly you might find a bus driving past with a big billboard saying, live in the moment or just do it. You, know, you might have a question, should I do it now or not? When should I buy that property? And all of a sudden you might find the, uh, you know, the Nike message driving past you, but it's giving you a message. Could be anything. So if we are connected to the universe, the messages, the communication with the universe can happen in so many subtle ways. Now, who is a guru? Okay, so that which dispels darkness leading one to clarity is one's guru. Now, I've used the example of Sri Dhatatraya Swami. Um, you know, he was saying that I have this many number of gurus, 24 gurus. And he was saying something as inconsequential as a moth or something as expansive as the ocean. You have a huge variety of gurus. So the guru could be so many different things, but you have to be in that state of tune. Now you have to be in a space where, you have to be in a space where you are actually seeking personal growth. Because if you look at the Panthosha system that we have multiple bodies, it's not just this, you know, the, this physical body, this Anamaya Kosha. Uh, it is set in Waldorf schools. And I find that very practical, actually, because I've put my son in one of, one of those kind of schools earlier before we shifted to North Bangalore. And um, every study is a pretty one of developing. So if you look at and from 7 to 14, you from 14 to 14, you teach them rhythm, but it's loving the play. Function is maintained. And then if you come to the Next 14, when they have pu during from pu puberty onwards, suddenly the body starts becoming extremely sense aware of the senses. The senses are heightened because that's how nature will prepare the body for, for procreation, for persistence of the human race, for the souls to come in. So that's when you become their friend and you guide their ego development. But at 21, it's the Manamaya Kosha, the, the intelligence, the intellect is being developed. And um, after that, the Anandamaya Kosha is something that only one can develop on their own. Nobody can do it from outside. It has to happen from inside. And if it doesn't happen, then you go through lives and you come to a point where it starts happening out of your own volition. So you have to be in that. Uh, all of us as seekers have to step into that space where we start actively seeking. We cannot be made to see, seek by somebody else. Even if we are inspired by somebody else, even if we are, uh, we come across a book or set of instructions, we will not take it up unless we are ready. That's the beauty of this. We have to be ready. And once we are ready, like how uh, the, the uh, Dattatraya Swami has mentioned here, so many, he's got 24 gurus. Why? Because that is his drishti. That is the way he looks at life. You know? the power of his perspective, of his vision, he will start seeing the guidance from the, from the universe in so many different ways. Now, there are some practices. Um, uh, Swati, or um, I think please do um, alert me about the time because I'm just going ex tempo, I'm sharing. So uh, as and when um, I might approach the ending of this uh, this sharing time slot because uh, there are, I would like a session to question and answer. Please do alert me when the time comes. Rami, if you have another 25 minutes. Great. About half an hour. Thanks, Arjun. Right. Now, what could be some of the pra uh, esoteric practices? Why, why are these called esoteric sciences? It's because we are, cl we are classifying them from the drishti of the industrial revolution-based education, which does not, which had not recognized really anything beyond the five senses. If you look at science, 
it basically enhances each of the five senses be it the most powerful telescopes to the most powerful telescopes, it enhances the sight. Be, uh, if you look at, you know, you have accordingly equipment that enhance the ability to perceive um, all the different senses. But only when microwaves and others were discovered in the earlier, earlier 20th century, did we find that, the, that did, we, did modern science become open to the unseen world of energy. And now that we talk about God particle and other things, we are aware also that there are many more aspects yet to come. But at least science is now, it's really modern science is science in its infancy when it comes to engineering, when it comes to technology, when it comes to philosophy or biology, understanding about the human body, how to keep it healthy and so on. Where Asanatan Dharma, because of the wisdom of the yogis who are the true scientists, of your was aware of all these things. And the, this powerful knowledge was withheld from us because of collective human ignorance, which now is slowly opening up to the depth of this knowledge. And the deeper aspects of knowledge, till we get a proper hang of it, has been classified as esoteric sciences. Now, there are some of us who are more sensitive, and I'm sure we have many amongst us here who are psychically or spiritually more sensitive. Um, I'm sure all of us are to some degree because we wouldn't be here otherwise, are aware that there are certain practices that can support the, our growth in many more ways than what meets the eye or the nose or the skin or the, or the tongue or the ear. So one of these practices on this brightest full moon day A way of subtle energy that comes from the full moon on this day, which is vastly magnified. And you can When the sun is not too hot, is our consciousness. So, like I was saying, the full moon um, of the Guru Purnima night has the ability to also heal. So, if you have the good fortune of exposing yourself to this 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 kind of an environment, uh, try to avoid eating uh, after sunset. Eat before that, and then just spend some time in the cool moonlight and contemplate on what direction you want your life to take. Talk to the inner guru within and make a strong resolution. You'll find the likeness of it coming true is much stronger because of the Purnima. And that is how it has been aligned. You know, the, the, uh, the sankalpa to learn, to seek and to grow is supported uh, thing in a much more powerful manner by the universe. Isn't that beautiful? It's one of nature's cycles again. Now, we um, at the School of Ancient Wisdom always learn the shloka and um, we'll do it at, at the end of our satsang today as well. Asatoma Sadgamaya. I'll just chant it. Asatoma Satka Maya Tamasoma Otir Gamaya Brutoma Amrutam Gamaya O Shanti 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 Now what does it mean? Many of us may already know, but just to refresh our memories, Asatoma, Asat. Sat is the truth and Asat is the untruth. So, 
it, this is just a cry from I to the universe to make me move. Gamaya, no? gamaya, gamaya means make me move towards, make move towards. And when you say ma, that is me. So asat, from asat, from untruth, move me to truth. From darkness, tamasoma, move me to, to light. Mrityo, uh, move me to, uh, from, I think death, move me to immortality. May peace, may peace be, may may peace prevail always, everywhere. So this is actually a shloka number twenty-eight from the Braha Braha Karanyaka Upanishad. So that's the shloka that we chant ever so often. Shloka number twenty-eight. So my experience now with Guru Purnima, before I just mind is that I never thought I never really I was born as a Hindu in a Hindu family. But I grew up in a convent, a Christian convent. And um, the Christian schools were at that time when I was born in the 70s, probably the best quality of education in India. Because the other the other schools of thought were not very, and the the gurukulas have been systematically destroyed in the 17th, 18th century. So our traditional education system, which was very sustainable, which was uh, which resulted in a very high level of tupti uh, of satisfaction from life and sustainability, that was removed. And normally, when you um, come across lack of love, that is when you act actually value love. So our country had to go through this. It, it could have been anybody. It just happened to be the British. It doesn't mean we have to be angry with them. It was just a part of a country's karma. Now, so the idea is there is no hard feelings, but there is a learning that we have to be present to. Now, when I was, when I grew up, all this Ramayana, Mahabharata and other things, there were just very nice stories. In fact, my own parents, I mean, maybe my father remembered, but most of them, my grandparents, uh, my my mother and others they were quite you know westernized. Um, they were interacting with the British and so on and so forth. So uh, in that kind of kind of environment, um, we never knew that we had our own samskaras. In fact, um, being Indian was not. Of course, I mean, we, uh, all Indians knew the strength of our Indian family value systems because the. And everyone knows now, how to research, that the success of any civilization is measured by the strength of its families. And the moment the family systems start breaking down, it heralds the beginning of the end of that civilization. Because once a family structure, a structure breaks down, there's a higher chance of people who are less balanced uh, to you know, prevail. And uh, they can get very aggressive because of their, that lack of balance. And human beings start becoming more self-centered rather than community-centered. So I came from that kind of environment where I, I thought all this was just a legend. You know, there were just stories, very nice stories, and so on and so forth. But due to certain experiences in life, I started seeking the truth. I, try, I tried getting onto the bandwagon sometimes as a child of lying or, you know, or, or being aggressive or, being, or, or trying to be, do a one-up on others in school. But somehow I never succeeded. Uh, I only succeeded when I was a good person. <laughs> You know, if I tried to be bad, I kind of got it back. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm such a failure. I mean, look at all these people who are so assertive. They're the ones I was always told you have to be tough in life. And, you know, you have to, uh, you know, stand your ground and show who's strong and all that stuff. Now, uh, later on, I uh, ended up in boarding school where society structures are even more unstable when you're in a boy school, boarding school because young males can be the most aggressive aspect of humanity because as we grow up generally and we get married and society uh, kind of knocks us into you know confirmation we tend to mellow down even the bullies in class would tend to mellow down a bit but the most 
ruthless and the most um, uncaring can be found in that profile of young males, you know, just post puberty and so on. So um, at that time, I experienced certain aspects where I felt, oh no, I'm not strong enough to handle this. But I later realized that I did not jump onto the bandwagon blindly. I didn't start using bad language. I didn't start bullying others. I did not start doing some of those things that I was told to do. And I realized that um, actually there's a split thing. And at one one point, I just, um, when I felt my mind was no longer strong, I was no longer coming first in class, because I always used to come first in class and I pride myself on that. Um, so um, when I, I came back from Zambia to India, I because of my poor Hindi marks, I was forced to take up a second language, Hindi. In the eighth standard, it was difficult. I, I lost my trump card, that was my academics. And then I started thinking my mind has become weak and I need to strengthen my mind. And when I came across this um, uh, Mind Control Institute of Calcutta, I, I used to buy the cassettes and try to make the mind strong again. But then one Ekadashi, believe it or not, uh, many years ago, I just come out of a Venkateshwara temple in Banashankari, second stage, media complex near there. And one strange man sat there in a bookstore and I said, do you have a book on mind control? And he said, I think you should read this book called The Autobiography of the Yoga Paramahansa Yogana. I was wondering what this book was about. I mean, it was alien to me. But I looked for it in some books, so I got the book, and my mind was quite blown. I'm not a kind of person who gets shocked with anything, not even death. But I was quite, um, I was almost shivering. I remember when I, read, I was reading that book constantly. I wouldn't put it down. I would read it all night long. And sometimes I would shiver and chanting the name of Babaji, you know, Mahavatar Babaji. And I would yearn, I started yearning for a guru uh, of that type, you know. And um, that was, I didn't realize at the time, but that was the point where I started seeking. I forgot about it, you know, and I went on with my life. Then things started happening. A friend of mine told me about um, Hare Krishna Mahamantra, somebody who uh, didn't make any sense. She, she just said, look, just chant and you'll, you, you will start seeing some things happening in your life. Now, my father was a member of this con in Zambia. I never thought much of it. And I always felt they were a brainwashing entity where, you know, they kind of brainwashed people to move away from their families and into the temples. This is the kind of the wrong information I was given. It may have been true in some cases, but it's not really. So uh, when I came across the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, I, I thought, of, let me take it up. This friend of mine seems to be quite an ardent devotee. Why not? I mean, there's nothing to lose. So... I took it up and I started noticing things were falling into place in my life, my career and other things. So you see, first it was a book, then it was a chant. And then after um, many other experiences, I suddenly came across, um, I remember Vidya Birkar from our own satsang. She had invited me to her bookstore saying that a couple of gurus are coming over to launch a book. And it turned out to be 3M and he was launching his first book, you know. Um, Apprentice to a Himalayan master. So uh, I, think that, I think that was what it was. Yeah. So then I met him over there. I just saw him. I didn't even know who he was. He was talking to many people before the uh, meeting. I just said hello to him. For some reason, I just said hello to him. And he looked at me suddenly and he, uh, and he smiled. And little did I know that he was 3M because he came in later when the program started and he started talking to us. And he just uh, at the end, I was in tears and I just went to take his blessings. For what reason I was in tears, I did not know. But when I went to take his blessings, I said, ah, I see that you're a Krishna devotee. So then I thought, my goodness, I mean, he's definitely a not an ordinary person. He's able to see things. And I also remember the way Ma Manize would guide me so many times, you know. I feel all these things, um, and even the way I came to the School of Ancient Wisdom may have appeared to be like a series of coincidences. But what I've observed is when one starts seeking, when one really puts in the effort, I have observed many, uh, in through my life at the right time. Sometimes when all the chips are down, you feel like and there's you know all the doors are closed. All of a sudden, a ray of light shines through a window open somewhere, and this is what I've experienced again and again. Even though my faith may not be as strong as it should be, but nonetheless, I just know that you know there is a higher force that's guiding me and looking over myself and all my loved ones and everybody, in fact. It's just that we have to become present to it. And these have been my experiences of 
the relevance of my experiences of, of, of finding a wonderful guru and following that guru's instruction. And if one surrenders to those instructions, the, your, your ability to speak to your own higher self, your inner guru becomes so much stronger. And that is the message I'd like to leave us all with here, that we have to follow that inner calling. And as Maman, I remember Mamanese's last words before, uh, and the la very last time I spoke to her, I never knew that she was going to fall sick the next week and so on. It was on a Thursday satsang. And I, I, told, I was excitedly telling her that, oh, Mama, you know, I've found this wonderful, I met this wonderful guru. I, I'd love to meet gurus and, you know, all these seekers and spend time with them. And so I said, I met this wonderful person the other week and, and so on. And then she just looked at me and said, when will you discover and hear your own inner guru? She said, that was the last instruction I remember. And it remains with me even to this day. And it has so much relevance to what we are talking about today. So that's the message I'd like to leave. I, I'd, li I'd like to close with today on this talk on Guru Purina. So Thank you so much, Ramesh. That was really nice. It was an excellent talk. And just a few days before Guru Nima, thank you so much for agreeing. I called Ramesh this afternoon at about one o'clock and he agreed to. So thanks a lot. And open it up yes, for please. questions. Is that okay, Ramesh? You are the one who normally <laughs> asks a lot of questions at the satsang. Let's ask others to question. So uh, switch off your PowerPoint. Please. Sure. The slides. Yes. I'll okay. just stop sharing it now. Yeah, stop sharing. Thank you. Now, is there anyone who'd like to ask any questions? Go ahead. Unmute What's yourself and me? ask the question. Thank you so much. Like I was telling Sajni ji, when I heard it was Ramesh ji speaking, I said, I must some make it even though I have so many guests.